Okay. We are live. We are so alive. <laughs> all right. Good morning, one and all, everyone who is joining us this morning. I pray again that you are well. A lot of things are happening. A lot of things conflicting, a lot of things weakening, a lot of things sad, a lot of things hopeless. But we have a different message. We have God's message. We have the message of life, eternal life, the message of hope, forgiveness of all our sins. And we thank God for raising us up this morning, this day, because many wished to be alive today who did not make it last night. Thousands of people died last night from one thing or another. So if you're still around to hear this message, it means God wanted you to hear it. So do not take it lightly. Thus, listen carefully to what the Lord has given me to share. This morning, we are going to be in the book of Romans. We are back in the book of Romans. But before we go there, we're going to go to the Lord and pray, ask for his blessing. The blessing has already been given, but that he may help us with the hearing. We pray not for his benefit, but for our own benefit, that we may receive clear messages, understanding, be awakened to spiritual things. Okay? So let us go before him. Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you again this morning. And for all things that you've given us in Christ, we pray to acknowledge our weakness, to acknowledge our burdens and our helplessness apart from you. We pray, Lord, for the message that you've given me. And I know it is offensive. And I pray that you give me the ability to share it and that you also give your people the ears and the humility to hear, to learn, and to unlearn. I thank you for the body of Christ, from all those chosen from the foundation of the world, from before the foundation of the world. Every tongue, people, and nation scattered across the world be with them, and as many as you minister to with this message, Lord, may you help them. We honor you, glorify you, and in all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, good people, I think we are good to go. Romans 9, Romans 9, I had gotten to be greedy just as I was writing the message. I thought I would be able to go from verse 14 to 23, but as I was writing, I realized there's just way many things to say. So we shall only go as far as verse 20. So Romans 9 verse 14, or verses 14 to 20. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not, God forbid, may it never be. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power 
in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills and whom he wills he hardens. You say to me then, why does he still find fault? We should be back. Can someone confirm that we have the sound back? Before I proceed. But we're going to have to start from the beginning, unfortunately. Can someone confirm that we have the sound back? I think the sound should be back. Okay, so these are all technical glitches. That's why you do not want salvation by works. But for purposes of unity of the teaching, I'm going to have to go back to the beginning. Okay. So we're going to go to Romans 9, verse 14 to 20, and I'm going to read again. I guess the Lord wants us to read it again. <laughs> He's sovereign, right? Verse 14, Romans 9. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Certainly not, for he says to Moses, I'll have mercy on whomever I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whomever I'll have compassion. So then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Therefore he has mercy on whom he wills, and whom he wills he hardens. You say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? But indeed, O men, who are you to reply against God, Will the thing formed say to him, who formed it, why have you met me thus? Why have you met me like this? And that is the word of the Lord. And I've given you four titles and I'm going to repeat them for the sake of those who may have joined us just now. We have four titles to the message. Is there unrighteousness with God? Is there unrighteousness with God? Number two, for this very purpose I raised you. For this very purpose I raised you. Number three, why does he still find fault? And number four, the potter's freedom. And I had said, Romans 9 is just chock full of titles. Every verse of Romans 9 can be used as a launch pad to carry a full message. And any one of these can by themselves carry the message. And I do not think that I have time in the world to exhaust the content of what God was saying even as has been captured in the titles. But we begin with objections. We begin with objections, objections about the sovereignty of God. And people have filled their mouths with a lot of objections, with a lot of arguments against God and very foolish for that matter, as Job said of himself, as he was under affliction, laboring under the burden of his losses. 
the burden of his pain, the mental, the physical anguish, and the false accusations of his buddies, his Armenian friends. And Job had recorded for us, or God had recorded for us this conversation from Job 23, verse 1 to 5. And he says, then Job answered and said, even today my complaint is still bitter. His hand is heavy despite my groaning. All that I may, all that I knew where I might find him, that I might come to his seat. And I want you to pay close attention and process the desperation that is conveyed in that verse. Job, with this affliction, did not have ibuprofen, no painkiller, no narcotics to ease his pain. And Mrs. Job did not help the situation either. So he longed to have an immediate audience with God that he may present his case so that he may be vindicated of his claims that he had not sinned and maybe in the process get some relief from his God-imposed affliction. But I want you to see the depth and seriousness of that statement, the desperation and the agency of it, all that I knew where I might find him, all that I knew where I might find God because of the situation that I am in. Many people think that they can just open the door and find God and demand him to answer all their questions. And we shall see if God allows such unruly behavior from his customers, from his creation. When it comes to God, the teaching, the thought that the customer is king must perish. That is just marketing gimmicks that do not transfer with God. It does not transfer well. That attitude that the customer is king does not transfer well when it comes to God. God alone is king and he will straight you straight. He will set you straight. But under such affliction as Job had, the matter of seeking relief was ever urgent, was ever so urgent, and yet it was not coming. Death and life only happen at God's bidding. He has, and he alone has, life and death in his hands. And even now, many seek to die because of their affliction. But God has not granted it to them to die. Not today. Maybe not this week. Not this year. They must continue to labor under the affliction that God has given them. 
or that I knew where to find him. All that I knew. I want you to think about that line. All that I knew where to find. Not if I knew where to find my mother or grandmother. Because they can't help you. Even if you find them. But find him. Because if you cannot find him, there's no relief. And you have no way for you to find him. You and I have no way to find him. We do not know where to find him. And yet he is there. He must come to you and me first. If he must be found, he must Reveal himself. And when he has come, he will say something like, you know the way. <laughs> you know the way to me. You know the way to the Father. I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no one comes to the Father but by me. And this only when he has come. In Isaiah 65, verse 1, this is what God says of himself. I was sought by those who did not ask for me. I was found by those who did not seek me. I said, here I am, here I am, to a nation that was not called by my name, and the NET says of the same verse, I made myself available to those who did not ask for me. I appeared to those who did not look for me. I said, here I am, here I am. Found by those that did not look for me. How do you find something that you're not looking for? <laughs> he says, I made myself available to those who did not ask for me. As you and me, my dear brothers and sisters, you did not look for God. He made himself available and appeared to you and I who were not looking for him. And in the matter of condemnation by God, many shall forever be saying the same. All that I knew where I might find him. And give me a chance to reason with him and try to vindicate myself. But Job knew who it is or who it was who had imposed this burden on him, and he wanted to have a conversation as to the why of it. Job wanted to come in the presence of God with his prepared arguments. Verse 4 of Job 23. Job said, I would present my case before him and fill my mouth with arguments. I would present my case before him. Exactly what I'm saying. Job had objections and arguments that he thought were strong and watertight against God. He thought he could stand on his own feet as his own mediator and defense lawyer and present his arguments like a lot of people think today. That they can prepare some good arguments to present before God to vindicate themselves. 
they have a lot of arguments, false notions. Unfortunately, that will get them in trouble. If God would show up to answer them. And the arguments are mostly or primarily against God's sovereignty in salvation. And of course, with the other lesser things of life. The arguments are going to be around the why. Essentially, they do not like or approve of the way that God has arranged to do things, the way that God has ordered things, his disposition of all things. And to the way of thinking, God should have regular town hall meetings so that he can answer some questions and be scolded whilst at that, yelled at by his creation, as often happens with politicians in these kinds of meetings. And after yelling at him, they would go home satisfied because they would have given him a good piece of their mind. But they have a serious problem in their thinking. They do not know who they're dealing with, as Job would soon discover. Naturally, people have a God problem. And by that, I mean, they do not know the God of Job. They do not know the God that Isaiah saw in his vision and said, whoa, is me. Not how cool am I to see God. As I said, oh, I am so ruined, I am undone. That was Isaiah's vision in the year that King Uzziah died. So let us hear what happened when the God of Job, the God of all creation, showed up to court. This is what is going to happen when the God of creation shows up to defend himself. Job 38. Job 38, verse 1 to 4. Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Oh, so wonderful, Job. Thank you so much. You're such a wonderful lawyer. <laughs> no, verse 2. Who is this? Who darkens counsel by words without knowledge, by words without wisdom? Now, prepare yourself like a man. I'll question you, and you shall answer me. I shall demand answers from you. Oh, no, this is not looking good. God comes and immediately asks for Job's resume. He sees V and says, who is this? Whose child are you? Who darkens counsel with words without knowledge? Darkening the counsel of God with words without knowledge. Many words without knowledge, are being spoken from the pulpits this morning in the name of God, in the name of Christ, in the name of the gospel, even in the name of the Holy Spirit. But one day, God will show up with a transcript of their foolishness. But God began to question Job's right to raise objections. And said, let us see what you have done. That's our starting point. Show me what you have done beyond eating chicken wings and fries. 
And if you can point at anything significant that you have done, then I will sit down and listen to your arguments. Show me something that you've done of importance. First, first of all, where were you? <laughs> where were you? Was he here that you're in trouble? Where were you? When I laid the foundations of this, tell me if you have understanding. Pay attention to when I, when I did this, where were you? Where was your mother? Yes, God wants to know what you have actually done of significance to warrant his attention. Let's keep hearing. Let's go to Job 40. Let's go to Job 40, verse 1 to 12. It's God's time to speak. Moreover, the Lord answered Job and said, Shall the one who contends with the Almighty correct him? He who rebukes God, let him answer it. Then Job answered the Lord and said, Behold, I am vile. <laughs> I thought you had arguments. I thought you had good arguments against God. When God shows up, this is the only thing you can say if you can say anything. Behold, I am vile. Why shall I answer you? Because you have nothing. I lay my hand over my mouth. Once I've spoken, but I will not answer. Yes, twice, but I will proceed no further. I will proceed no further, Your Honor. I will take my seat. I will gladly take my seat, Your Honor. <laughs> Then the Lord answered Job out of the whirlwind and said, Now prepare yourself like a man. I will question you and you shall answer me. God is going to say, I still need you to answer my questions. Verse 8, would you indeed annul my judgment, cancel my judgment, annul my decree to bring suffering to you? Would you indeed annul my sovereign will? Would you condemn me that you may be justified? That you, the sinner, the vile person, may be justified. And I, the God of creation, be condemned. Have you an arm like God, verse 9? Or can you thunder with a voice like his? Can you do that? Then adorn yourself with majesty and splendor and array your glory and beauty. Make yourself beautiful. Do not use any foundation cream. Make yourself beautiful. Let me see how glorious you are. Disperse the rage of your wrath. Look on everyone who is proud and humble him. Look at everyone who is proud and bring them low and bring them down as God did with King Nebuchadnezzar. God says he alone is able to humble anyone and everyone. Look on everyone who is proud and bring him low tread down the wicked in their place. What is the point? The point, you do not want God to show up and answer your objection. You do not want God to answer your objections against him. 
because it is not going to be nice. So when you do that, you better double up on your diapers or stay close to the party. And what is the solution to not have God show up in displeasure? What is the correct way? Align with what he has said about everything because it cannot be challenged. God cannot be challenged. But the Jews had the book of Job. So that was our introduction. I'm trying to get you to warm up to the message, to think correctly about what is to come. The Jews had the book of Job. They knew the story of Job. And yet they still had objections against Paul's doctrine of salvation. They were not warming up to this message of God's grace. Because it seemed to denigrate, to make a mockery to minimize Moses, the law, and their obedience to it. And for this very thing, they wanted Paul dead. And the Jews were okay with election as long as it was excluding the Gentiles. But when that election came close to their own homes, they began to raise the same objections that Armenians raised to this very day. And say it is not fair. The Jews were very much steeped in high sovereignty. As long as they thought it was on their side, as long as they thought that God was on their side. But God's sovereignty is a very tricky matter when it seems to be working against you. Because there are many in the professing church who profess God's sovereignty when it's convenient for them, but have a tendency to build wooden fences around that sovereignty so that they may keep God caged like an animal in the boundaries of their making or what they consider to be safe for him. So they will limit what God is sovereign over, for instance, they do not want God implicated in anything to do with sin and evil because that would overthrow their false God, their idols. But once you build a fence around God's sovereignty to limit it, I'm going to tell you, that you do not worship the God of the Bible. Yes, you go to church every Sunday. And all the prayer meetings, and you pray a lot, you give money to the church, but you do not believe in the God of the Bible. You worship an idol. Because when he shows up, he is going to ask the same question and say, who is this? Who darkens counsel with words without knowledge? So I do not care what verses one may quote to try and prop up their arguments. 
It doesn't matter if they have two PhDs in theology. Sin and evil are by God's decree and power. I'm going to say that again. Sin and evil are by God's decree and power. They do not happen of themselves. And that for his glory, he made all things to glorify himself. Because nothing in this creation happens if it did not come from his blueprint of decrees and is not empowered by him. He alone is the almighty God. He alone has power. There's no creature that has power. There's no creature. There's no creature that has power to cause anything. So Paul has come and argued that the rejection of the gospel by the Jews of whom the whole world would have expected to naturally receive the Messiah was due to election that was even within the people of Israel. He has told them that they are necessarily not all God's children because of their birth certificates. Not necessarily God's children because of the forefathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Rather, God has always been in the discrimination business, the election business, the offensive business. And election, my brothers and sisters, is the foundation of the church. The church is founded on God's electing grace. And yet, this is the most hated doctrine in many of the pulpits. Preachers in their pews will run you out of town like a dog with the rabies if you bring God's sovereign election in salvation to them. They don't want to hear it. They do not want to hear it. They just want people to go to the basement after church and eat snacks and talk. And talk about missions and how they're putting this much money to go out there in the dark world to share the gospel. No, you don't need to go out there because you need the gospel. You need the gospel right in your basement. So Paul <laughs> had illustrated the doctrine of election and said, Romans 9, 6 to 8, we have a long message, people. I pray you brought something to eat. <laughs> I have some spiritual food. Romans 9, 6 to 8. But it is that the word of God has failed. It is not that the word of God has taken no effect. Paul says, in spite of all the advantages that Israel had had of coming from the fathers, as I said, of having the law, the covenants, the promises, it was not like the word of God had failed or had not taken effect or effect because of their unbelief. 
The word of God had not failed and has not failed to serve Israel. Or has God himself changed his mind? Because if God's word fails, then it means God has failed. And God cannot fail. The word of God had not failed. Because Paul, who was a Jew, had been saved. Peter, who was a Jew, was saved. And Paul saved against his will. Remember the Damascus Road experience. And at Pentecost, many Jews had come to faith in Christ, thousands of them. The issue was Israel in the flesh did not understand God's hermeneutics of who is Israel, God's definition of who is or who is considered his people. And they did not understand how salvation would come. And he said, for they are not all Israel who are of Israel. That sounds like a confusing state. What are you talking about? For they are not all Israel who are of Israel. And that means, from that statement, there was election within national Israel, there was a subset of the elect. A subset is a small section or a small number out of a bigger set. You would say in, in the illustration of set and subset, the US, the 50 states, that would be the set. And Ohio would be a subset. Right? Ohio is a subset of the country that is the USA. So God comes and says, in Israel, there is the set of national ethnic Israel. But within that set, there was another select people group that he calls Israel. So that was a subset of the elect called Israel, elect Israel, or spiritual Israel. That was drawn from the bigger set of national ethnic Israel. And it is this elect subset of Israel that belongs to God and is the true Israel of God. There's no way to run away from what I've just said if you're paying attention to the arguments. God is saying those people in the Middle East right there are not necessarily God's people because their name is Israel. That's clear teaching. There's no way to deny that. And there's a lot of Christians who do not believe this. So claiming that one is Abraham's child without faith in Christ is not going to cut it for Jesus. Jesus would say to the Jews in response to their objections and claims that they were Abraham's children and by extension, God's children. Because if you can claim that your father is Abraham, by extension, you are arguing that you belong to God. So there was conversation about this very matter between the Jews and Jesus. Let's go to John 8. John 8, 37 to 40. The Lord said, I know that you are Abraham's descendants. But the Jews are claiming that they are God's children because Abraham is their father. 
but you seek to kill me because my word has no place in you. I speak what I have seen with my father and you do what you have seen with your father. Jesus makes a distinction that there are two fathers here. I have my father and you guys have a different father from mine. And they answered verse 39 and said to him, Abraham is our father. Abraham is a father. And if Abraham is our father, we do not know you. We don't know anything about your father, Jesus. Yeah. There's some shenanigans that we have had from the grapevine. So we don't really know about you. But let's hear Jesus responding to them. And Jesus said to them, if you were Abraham's children, you would do the works of Abraham. But now you seek to kill me, a man who has told you the truth which I had from God. Abraham did not do this. They sought to kill him. And Jesus will soon tell them that the way of the father, of their father, the devil, who was a liar and murderer, and whose deeds they would soon perform to kill him. The Lord said, I agree with your natural birth certificates, with your natural claims with regards to Abraham, but spiritually, we have to make a distinction. You do not belong to Abraham. And therefore, you do not belong to God. Because those who belong to Abraham also belong to Christ and they believe in Christ. That's Jesus' distinction. Jesus is going to say down the chapter that Abraham saw my day and he was glad. And you guys have seen my day and you are mad at me. So those who are the true children of Abraham believe in Christ Jesus. So all that to say that Paul was not inventing new doctrine in the Jews' rejection of the Messiah, in trying to explain why the Jews have rejected the gospel. He is very much aligned with Jesus' teaching and experience. And so Paul continued and said, going back to Romans 9, verse 7, No, are they all children because they are the seed of Abraham, but in Isaac your seed shall be called. That is, those who are the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, but the children of the promise are counted as the seed. The children of promise are of the nature of Isaac, not of Ishmael. No matter how close Ishmael was to the promises in Abraham, Ishmael was the firstborn son of Abraham. This is how close he was to salvation. But God says no. And they like to have a different mother from Ishmael. The mother is Sarah, and Sarah is a picture of the New Covenant, New Testament, is a picture of Christ. They are the elect, they are the children of grace, and are born of God. They are not the children of God by the effort of anyone. They are not the children of God by the effort of anyone as we shall see. Romans 9, 9 to 13. For this is the word of promise. At this time I will come. And Sarah shall have a son. The promise, the word of promise is that God in his appointed time would come. 
and cause the birth of those that belong to him at this time, this appointed time, I shall come. And that means there's no drive through in salvation. And that is to say salvation cannot be expedited like a drive through order. You cannot expedite salvation. And so much for water baptism of infants to make them the children of God. If you're hearing me clearly, you cannot do that, my friends. My brothers, sisters, you cannot do that. Yes, it feels like you're doing something righteous and good. But that is misplaced zeal. We have taught on Hannah. We have a message on Hannah and the birth of Samuel in this very matter. And God was not, in that story, giving us instruction on what must be done when children are born. The New Testament sheds light on God's attitude on the matter of how one comes to be in Christ. It does. And many choose to ignore it because of their love of traditions. They are so beholden to their theological systems, covenantalism especially. But from your experience and mine, many were dedicated to God as children. And they have left the faith and even died in unbelief. This is the truth. Anyone who has been around the church for any useful amount of time will attest to the truth of what I'm saying. Many were dedicated to God. But somehow they left the faith because God is not obligated to our covenants. He is obligated to his own covenant. Only one covenant that God honors, and it is the covenant he made in the blood of his son. So I do appreciate the religious zeal, but check your zeal against the truth of how God has said he does things. Hold lightly to your efforts when it comes to salvation. Romans 9 arguments undo even the strongest and the best arguments for infant baptism and covenant children. Covenant children as it is posited by the reformed people, so-called. Hear this, verse 10, Romans 9. God says, and not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one man, even by our father Isaac. So God took his arguments a step further and said, let's, someone thinks they have some good arguments about what made Isaac and Ishmael to differ. Let me make this plain one more time. They could argue that Ishmael used cloth diapers and Isaac had the huggies or pampas that did not lick and was on a gluten-free diet and was not vaccinated. So God decided to choose Ishmael. But there are people who take these things for righteousness. Or that Ishmael was raised on a bottle, on cow milk, while Isaac was breastfed, or vice versa. So Ishmael did not have good immunity 
Both of them borrow. People's arguments in these things are not too far away from the silliness of how I've presented the arguments. I'm just being Pastor James silly in this regard, but you get the point. That's how silly people's arguments are. And that means people would still find something that they did to make themselves or their children to differ. And that little effort that they did is what made the difference for eternity. They just gave their children a little bit of nudge and took them from hell to heaven. Just a little nudge. Just breastfeeding. All my children were breastfed, by the way. But we don't make righteousness out of it. That is racketeering the gospel. Remember what the Lord said in John? He said the flesh profits nothing. Nothing, zero. The flesh profits nothing. All those things are works of the flesh. There's nothing that you and I do that profits anything before God. Like zero. He said, my words that I speak, they are life. So God said, let me level the playing field that I may illustrate my argument even more clearly. So he brought the case of Rebecca and Isaac as his exhibit B. The first exhibit was Ishmael and Isaac. Now he goes... A step further. And of course, we know that Rebecca had the twins because it is God who gave her the twins. Jacob and Esau for this very purpose. So is it Patrick? Rebecca had twins by one man, Isaac. Same mother. Same womb and same father. Unlike Ishmael and Isaac, we had different mothers. But lest you would think that the difference came down to what their mothers did or did not do and think Jacob went to a Christian academy and Esau went to a government school. God said, not so fast. Those things do not cause or determine or frustrate his eternal purpose. There's not a single thing that we do that gets in the way of what God determined to do. Heaven's doors are not closed to the elect because of public school, no matter how messed up they get. And neither are they opened by a Christian academy. A Christian academy does not open the way to heaven. I'm serious. But if that was true, I could not be preaching here. I could not. If you knew how I was raised and where I grew up, I could not be telling you this. But this is evidence. I am the evidence that God's purpose cannot be frustrated. It cannot. For the children, verse 11, for the children not yet being born, not having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God according to election might stand not of works, but of him who calls. It was said to her, the order shall save the younger. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau I have hated. I've just loved Jacob. 
I love the hillcatcher. I love the supplanter. I love the sinner in Jacob. What? Yeah. The children not yet born, that's point number one, none had stolen cookies. Or mommy's change, having done neither good nor evil. Done neither good nor evil. That is very important. You should underline that. They're done neither good nor evil. God wants you to pay attention to that point. It is too important in the development of his argument. And he's saying, his choice <laughs> was made between the two before neither had done anything that would cause God to favor or disfavor them or favor one over the other. In other words, God's election has nothing to do with what a person has done or will do, whether good or bad. It is independent of all human efforts of any kind to be good or to be bad. And that is why I said water baptism to make covenant children is a racket. It is a racket. The true covenant children are they whom God chose and gave to Christ before the foundation of the world. Those are the covenant children. And this is also to say your, your knowledge of God is not the cause of your salvation. It cannot be the cause of your salvation. Because the devil knows more about God than the best of men. But he is not saved. That's the precedent. And that also means God will save anyone whom he wants to save, even if they do not satisfy you. Their salvation was never given to you or to me to determine. We are called to not make the elect. We are called to declare God's choice and work in the salvation of his elect. We do not help God to save people. Whoever God wanted to be saved was already saved. That's the truth of it, my friends. I don't care if you disagree. <laughs> Whoever God wanted to save is already saved. Whether they know it now, that's none of your business. But of course, there will be objections to this. Because that sounds like a monster God who does not give people the choice to go to heaven. The truth of the matter is that there's none who wants to go to heaven. There's not a single person who wants to go to heaven. There's never been a single person who wanted to go to heaven. Save for Christ alone, because he came from there. People do not want to go to heaven or go to hell. They don't want to go to either of the places. We just want to have the best of life as much as we can until God comes and interrupts us and says hello. I'm here, oh, by the way, you belong to me, and by the way, my son died for you. That's how you came to Christ, my friends. He has to come and individually interrupt your life. You say, hello. I am the king of creation. 
I am your salvation. Come to me. That is why he has to come and draw us to him. He has to make us willing in the day of his power. He has to draw us to Christ. He must teach us. Otherwise, we're not coming. People don't want to go to heaven. Those are lies, my friends. If they wanted to go to heaven, they would not be clamoring for the economy to get better. Because the economy of heaven is way much better. I'm not lying. We would not be crying against inflation. What's the point? Salvation is not about what the creation does and decide. Salvation was never put on the ballot for men and women to cast their votes, like what is going to happen in November. It does not work like that. Salvation is a much bigger project that respects God's eternal sovereign will and purpose in Christ for his glory. Hear me again. Listen carefully. Listen carefully to what I'm saying. This is why I don't do point number one, point number two, point number three. We don't preach like that. I don't get behold and do point number one and point number two. I want the freedom to expand my things as God gives me ability. Hear me again. Even if you never sinned, you never sinned, that would not necessarily get you to heaven. That would not give you the right to be in God's presence. Because your not sinning is not and was never the condition of coming to heaven. God determined from as long as he has been God that if anyone should come, if anyone should have eternal life, it has to be by his grace alone and by the mediation of the blood of his son on the cross. And that alone, your sinless righteousness, if you ever had any, is still the righteousness of a creature. That's the distinction. It is not the same as the righteousness of God. What you need for salvation is not sinlessness in yourself. You need the righteousness of God. So sinlessness is not enough to earn eternal life Otherwise, God would have given us eternal life before Adam ate from the tree. Because he was already there. Eternal life cannot be end, period. Let me repeat that. Eternal life cannot be end. Because it is the quality, it is the property of the being of the eternal God alone. Thus, it can only be freely given. What belongs to God, to the nature of God, cannot be earned because then you are saying you are at the same level as God. You are growing yourself through humiliations and duties and humblings to become God. That's not how God became God. God has always been God, unchanged. The same yesterday, today, and forever. So even the holy angels did not earn their right to be in heaven. The holy angels did not earn their right to be in heaven. They are there because they're elect. And election is, hello, by grace alone. Because God says, 
this of the holy angels, Job 4, Job 4, 17 to 19. Job 17, sorry, Job 4, verse 17 to 19. Can a mortal be more righteous than God? But that's, that's right there, that's what I'm saying. Can a mortal be, it doesn't matter how well they do it, can they become more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? What is the expected answer? You know the expected answer. Impossible. Verse 18, if he puts no trust in his servants, if he charges his angels with error. See that? He charges his angels with error. How much more those who dwell in houses of clay, whose foundation is in the dust, who are crushed before a mother. How much more you would dwell in the house of clay that is in this fleshly body. This is the house of clay. If God finds fault in the holy angels, what about in me and you? So you see, this is a very offensive teaching. It is like eating at an Indian restaurant. You're going to have to eat with some yogurt where the food is hot. Get me some more yogurt. Uh, my wife and I went to some Indian restaurant. We were hungry one afternoon, one weekend. Like, okay, let's go to this Indian restaurant and get some food. I was like, okay, can you get me the mildest of the rice and whatever you have? Oh my goodness, me. Two bites, I'm like, please, more yogurt. <laughs> Give me some more yogurt. I can't take this. Too offensive to my tongue. It's hot. <laughs> Romans 9, 14. Romans 9, 14. That's where our message actually is going to begin. But listen to me carefully, my brothers and sisters. I take teaching seriously. So I don't write a message just so that we had something on Sunday. That I just showed up to show up. I don't do that. I've never done that with any of my messages. I take this work seriously. I put in time, and the Lord gives me grace to do this work. Verse 14. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? That's a good question. Is there unrighteousness with God? If we have properly understood the arguments that have been given, that objection must be raised, it must be anticipated. Because if God is making a determination of eternal destinations of individuals before they have done nothing bad, how is that fair? How is it fair? They've done nothing wrong. And that's what God is arguing. And if it is unfair, can God then be charged with unrighteousness as we deem unfairness? He must be unjust. That has to be the conclusion. If we are thinking correctly according to what has been presented, he must be unjust. But is that true? Is God unrighteous? And who is making that determination and using what kind of measurement stick to call God unrighteous? Is God unrighteous because we do not agree with him? Or that he does not agree with us? But does God need to agree with anyone? And does God need to do anything to be righteous? 
is God's righteousness tried in the course of human opinion. No, my brothers and sisters, God is God. And he is righteous whether he does nothing or does something or does anything, whether good or evil. God is so God that we have not a clue of who we are dealing with. We are clueless. Even I am clueless. That is the truth of the matter. I am clueless of this God that I'm speaking of. And if I'm telling the truth, it's because he is telling the truth. The God of all creation is no ordinary being. There is nothing, absolutely nothing, and there is absolutely no one like him. There's no one like him. It's impossible. He is above all things and more than we could ever try to imagine in all of eternity. This God is he who created the world. He sustains the universe. He holds all things by the word of his power. He created the world and its corruption and its vanity. It pleased him to make it this way, to subject or to subject his creation to corruption, to vanity, to uselessness, to futility. It is not Adam who caused it. It is not sin that caused it. It was not the devil who caused it. I know this will sound crazy to the majority of people's ears because they preached the glory of the flesh, not the glory of God. None of them has that kind of power. It is God alone who subjected his creation to vanity. And that for reason to prepare for the revelation and glory of his son as he redeemed and reconciled as many as should be reconciled to God. That's exactly what is happening behind the scenes. It's God who caused it. And we do not apologize for that at all. We do not. <laughs> That's why we're never going to grow a mega church. This is no mega church business that I'm preaching. This stuff for the elect. So those who try to dress up God and put some lipstick on him, try to make him pretty with some fancy clothes, try to protect him from being the author and bring of sin and evil are clueless of this God and his purpose. They're clueless. They get stuck. And this is why when people argue with atheists, atheists make more sense than a lot of professing Christians. Because atheists see the cause and effect. They are rational. They can tell that these people are not telling the whole truth. Do not apologize for God. Do not protect God. He doesn't need protection. He doesn't have COVID. Do not wear a mask around him. <laughs> He's not going to get sick. Sneeze as much as you want to sneeze. He will be fine. They're clueless. And I know they will not receive my testimony. And it is mutual. I don't receive theirs either. But as I say, this is not out of man. God must teach you to see and believe this. If God teaches you, you will see it. 
and everything begins to make sense. That's the only way. God was never overtaken napping by his creation. So sin was his work to prepare the stage for the glory of Mount Calvary and for the sitting of his son on the right hand of the majesty on a high because he made an end to the purification of sin. Yeah? <laughs> Here the God of the Bible. Verse 15, Romans 9. For he says to Moses, I will have mercy on whomever I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whomever I will have compassion. And this was coming from this discourse that God had with Moses. Moses had gotten to be a little familiar with God and thought he could ask if he could see his face, just see a little bit more. Exodus 33, let's go there, 17 to 20. Exodus 33, 17 to 20. So the Lord said to Moses, I'll also do this thing that you have spoken. For you found grace in my sight, and I know you by name. And he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I'll make all my goodness pass before you, and I'll proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face. For no man shall see me and live. If I show you my face, you must die. If you see my face, I have to put you in the cleft of the rock and I have to cover you with my hand. I have to put you in Christ, the rock. And that's the only way you're going to see God. You cannot just flip flop your way into God's presence like you're going to Walmart. It doesn't work like that. You're going to get killed. I'll be gracious to whom I'll be gracious, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. What is that saying? It is saying exactly that. It is saying God will unconditionally serve. Unconditionally serve, have mercy on whomever he wants. And that's clear. And that means all of salvation happens apart from anything that is in the sinner. God is saying whether a person is saved or not comes down to his sovereign will and purpose. It pleased him, if it pleased him, to elect a person to salvation, then that person is saved. And nothing will change God's mind about them. It doesn't matter what they do. It is this, doesn't matter what they do that drives a lot of religious people crazy. And that's the truth. If you elect, you elect. It cannot be undone. And if that is true, that God will have mercy on whomever you have mercy, what is the necessary conclusion? Verse 16, so then it is not of him who wills, nor of him who runs, but of God who shows mercy. Very clear teaching. If it is all of God's purpose and doing, then it follows that it is not of him who wills, nor of the one who decides or chooses Jesus, not of him or her who weeps and repents, because remember Esau cried with many tears, but those tears could not undo God's decree. It is not of him who runs, of him who puts effort, not of him who has many religious duties, not of him who was baptized, not of him who gets up at three in the morning to pray as if there's congestion in heaven, 
with no traffic congestion. It is of God who shows mercy. And grace and mercy are unconditional on the sinner or towards the sinner. Grace and mercy, conditional. Unconditional, sorry. Grace and mercy, unconditional. Salvation is God showing mercy to whomever he wants. Because that's what he was pleased to do. He delights in showing mercy to as many as he gave to Christ. Verse 17, Romans 9. For this, for the scripture says to Pharaoh, for this very purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. So we have addressed the matter of is there unrighteousness with God. Now we go to the second section of our titles. For this very purpose, I've raised you. So God went for another illustration from the Old Testament. You see, the arguments are coming from the Old Testament. That's why we love the Old Testament. To drive this point home, his sovereignty. And this is coming from Exodus 9, verse 16. But indeed, for this purpose, I have raised you up that I may show my power in you and that my name may be declared in all the earth. That was God's message to Pharaoh through Moses. So the context or background was Israel had been in captivity to Pharaoh in Egypt. And there'd been a series of communications and language of God hardening Pharaoh's heart and Pharaoh not letting the people Go according to God's command. But God comes to Moses and says something strange. Rather than ascribing the stubbornness of Pharaoh to Pharaoh and his grandfather, and say, Pharaoh, you are so stubborn just like your grandfather. God comes and makes claim that he was ultimately the one behind Pharaoh's stubbornness. The first cause of Pharaoh's stubbornness. In other words, Pharaoh had no ability. Hear me, someone. Hear me, someone. Pharaoh had no ability to set the people free or to refuse their freedom. He could only do or be what God wanted him to be and respond in the way that God wanted him to respond with every turn. He could not set Israel free as long as God had not caused him to set the people free. Hear me and understand this. It doesn't matter how many plagues God would have brought on Pharaoh. He could have brought a million plagues and killed everyone, including Pharaoh's wife and everybody around him. Pharaoh would still not have let the people free. The man with the withered hand thought of stretching his hand every single day of his life. He thought about it. He thought about his limitation. But he could not stretch it until Christ came and said, stretch out your hand. 
And that was a divine, a divine decree. That was a divine command. Stretch out your hand. That's the command of God. And he stretched out his hand because in that command was power. The words of Jesus are not empty like our words. When he speaks, things happen. Stretch out your hand, and the hand gets stretched. Let there be light, and there was light. The issue, woman with the issue of blood wanted to stop her bleeding in those 12 years of her affliction, but to no avail. But it took Jesus showing up again to give a divine command. Jesus does not have to speak on a microphone for a divine command to operate or for you and I to hear it because a lot of people sometimes they don't know how to read these things. They're like, oh, but Jesus did not say this. What happened? To, was that the daughter of the centurion? Was Jesus there? He wasn't there. Did he say anything to the centurion? Not really, as far as the divine command, no. The point is, if anything happens, it has to be by a divine command. So Pharaoh could not keep holding the people when God had determined that it was time for them to be free. He could not. But God comes and says of Pharaoh, for this very purpose I raised him. What? God raised Pharaoh. I thought it was his mother. And aunt, who was the babysitter, and grandma, who raised him and took him to the pediatrician for his vaccinations. <laughs> no, God says, not too fast. I raised Pharaoh. I brought Pharaoh into existence and made sure that he could not get polio. Not measles, not COVID. Why? because God was going to use him to preach the gospel. God raised Pharaoh to be a picture of God as the sovereign of Egypt and also as a picture of the law. The hardening of Pharaoh's heart was in the picture of God. In other words, God was preaching himself through or in the person of Pharaoh. And I'm gonna explain this because many do not understand typology. When you have a sovereign person in the Bible, as the king of a nation, you must think of God first if you have to interpret them correctly. It doesn't matter how offensive God makes that person. God is preaching something about himself through that offense. Because the sovereign God or the sovereign does whatever they want, as God said of Nebuchadnezzar. Here what Daniel said to Belshazzar when Daniel was interpreting that handwriting that had been put on the wall, God had written a message on the wall, and no one was able to interpret it but Daniel. So Daniel came. Hear what Daniel said, Daniel 5. Daniel 5, verse 17 and to 19. Daniel 5, 17 to 19. Then Daniel answered and said before the king, let your gifts be for yourself and give your rewards to another. Yet I will read the writing to the king and make known to him the interpretation. O king, the most high God gave Nebuchadnezzar your father 
a kingdom and majesty, glory and honor. A kingdom, majesty, glory and honor that tells you that Nebuchadnezzar is a type of God the Father because only God has that. And because of the majesty that he gave him, all peoples, nations, and languages trembled and feared before him. You see that? That is a description of God. All peoples and nations and languages tremble. And that is only true with God. And that is saying Nebuchadnezzar was a picture. Whomever he wished, now listen to the sovereignty of the sovereign king. Whomever he wished, he executed. Whomever he wished, he kept alive. Isn't that what Paul is saying? Whomever he wished, he set up. And whomever he wished, he put down. Only God does that. And that's what I am saying that when you look at these kings that were recorded for us in the Bible, they are preaching God himself. Pay attention to that verse 19, because that's what the sovereign does. Nebuchadnezzar, Pharaoh, were types of God the Father. Yeah? So Pharaoh represented God in a number of things I will teach. Number one, in that he hardened his heart and would not let the people go. For Pharaoh as a human being, it was judicial hardening. God was pulling his strings. But when God says he hardened his heart with respect to himself, it means he did not let the people go. Who is not letting the people go is not Pharaoh, my friends. It is God. God is not being overpowered by Pharaoh. Pharaoh is being overpowered by God. God is overriding Pharaoh. So who is not letting the people go is not Pharaoh. It's God himself. So theologically, that is saying it is God who hardened his heart in that a people who are in slavery to sin cannot be set free by miracles and surely not by Moses and not by the law. What I'm saying, my brothers and sisters, requires grace to understand because people, once they see the hardening, they want to throw their hands in the air and say, how can you say God had in his own heart? That cannot be true. And I'm looking at you, I'm like, man, you don't even understand this. Calm down and listen to the Spirit. He will teach you. It's God who is saying, as the sovereign, the people under sin cannot be set free if the conditions of their freedom have not been met. And that's what God is building. Let's keep hearing. So the people must be set free on the condition that the firstborn of Pharaoh should be smitten of God and the Passover lamb should be sacrificed and the blood sprinkled and that the children of Israel would eat unleavened bread, bread without yeast, Yeast, a type of influence of sin, the unleavened bread being a picture of the sinless Christ, the bread from heaven. And God saying the sinner in bondage is only set free when the firstborn son of God, who is in the picture of the firstborn of Pharaoh, Christ Jesus, has been smitten of God. So the firstborn of Pharaoh, the unleavened bread, the Passover lamb, they are pictures of the Lord Jesus. And those were the only conditions of escape of the children of Israel from captivity, all pointing to the Lord Jesus. Because if 
the children of Israel had been set free, when the lies and the frogs were set free, then God would have been saying, we owe our salvation to the plague of frogs. You understand me? God would have been saying, you owe your eternal life and your righteousness to the plague of frogs. So God continues to harden Pharaoh's heart because he's driving us to the point of the death of his son, the Lord Jesus, the Passover lamb. That's what is happening. God, in the picture of Pharaoh, Pharaoh imprisoned the people of Israel. It is not sin that imprisoned us. It is God who imprisoned us through sin. <laughs> you understand me? Sin by itself is not what imprisoned us. It is God who used sin and the law to imprison us. Because the power of sin is in the law. You should know that by now from 1 Corinthians 15, Romans 3.19. Now we know. But whatever the law says, it says to those who are under the law, so that every mouth may be stopped, that every mouth may be silenced, and the whole world be guilty, be held accountable to God. And then Romans 8.24, the creation was subjected to futility, to corruption, that's what the Greek word means, to uselessness, to vanity, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it. Sin came to us not willingly. We were subjected to it by God. But in hope of the redemption that is in Christ. And if you're thinking correctly, there's none who escaped from Egypt who ascribed their freedom to anything that they did. Not a single one. None ascribed their faith to their freedom. They said it is God who set us free. It was the blood of the Passover lamb that set us free. Yeah? Hear this again, Exodus 9.16. But indeed for this purpose I have raised you up, that I may show my power in you, and that my name may be declared in all the earth. Pay attention to that. Because many are quick in their reading of the story to run to the destruction of Pharaoh, and they end up missing the point of God's statement. The destruction of Pharaoh's army was not the ultimate glory in the story. Yes, it happened. Yes, God glorified himself. But the greater story was in the redemption of the people by the Passover lamb. The glory was in the means that God used to cause the exodus of his people. The glory of our salvation is not that sin was destroyed. Yes, that's true. The glory is that the Son of God was crucified and he overcame and he is seated. The glory goes to the Son. It doesn't go to that which was defeated. So Pharaoh was raised for a purpose that God may show his power in him as a type of God holding his people in captivity and then redeeming them and this as a matter of God's sovereignty and that means Pharaoh was more than just a type of God the Father. He also was a type of the law because of this. Exodus 5, 4 to 9 
when I make a theological statement, I have to back it up. Because a lot of people say, oh, this is the type of Christ. I'm like, okay, show me how that relates to Christ. And there's nothing there. You are the type of the law. Show me how this is the type of the law. Nothing. We don't do that. I have to show you. Because you want to say that to other people and then not know how to connect the understanding to them. Exodus 5, 4 to 9. Then the king of Egypt said to them, that is to Moses and Aaron, Moses and Aaron, why do you take the people from their work? Get back to your labor. And Pharaoh said, look, the people of the land are many now, and you make them rest from their labor. So the same day, Pharaoh commanded the taskmasters of the people and the officers, saying, you shall no longer give the people straw to make brick as before. Let them go and gather straw for themselves. And you shall lay on them the quart of bricks which they made before. We shall not reduce it, for they are idle. Therefore they cry out, saying, let us go and sacrifice to our God. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it and let them not regard false words. Pay attention to verse 8. The quarter of bricks was stipulated by Pharaoh. This was the amount that each person had to make every day without fail. If you were supposed to make 500 big bricks every day, you would make the 500 bricks every day. And Pharaoh said, that number cannot be reduced for these enslaved people being merciless with them. And they would not get any help to get the straw either, but they were to meet their quarter every day by their own laboring. And that means this was preaching what the law of God requires of a sinner on a daily basis. The law has a standard of perfection to be met every second, every second, as Pharaoh daily imposed a quarter of bricks. He didn't say every week, he said daily. The law requires perfection. That is what God said it should do. If God wanted to save people with 40% obedience, he would have done it. He saved you and me with how much obedience to the law? Zero. He did. Zero. But he gave the law to teach that it is impossible to earn eternal life. That was the point of the quarter. And that is the point of the law. And the quarter or standard could not be reduced as the law cannot be lowered to make it doable as many people are doing. They are reducing their daily quarter of bricks on their own command, not according to the command of Pharaoh. They are in violation of Pharaoh's command. But the law does not help you to get straw to meet your quota of righteousness. It will condemn you. Because that's what it was given to do. And that is what the taskmasters were given to enforce. To enforce the decree of Pharaoh. The law was given to enforce the decree of God that righteousness cannot be ended. And if people really understand Pharaoh's command, and what the law requires, that is perfection in the case on everyone who breaks one unit of it, they would not regard false words in their false zeal, as Pharaoh rightly said in verse 9. Verse 9, this is what Pharaoh said, verse 9 of Exodus 5. Let more work be laid on the men that they may labor in it and let them not. Regard false words. False words of we are keeping the law because we love God. No, that's not true. 
So the law is unbendable because God says it is unbendable. As Pharaoh said, the coat of bricks cannot be reduced. And this is, my friends, how God was showing his power in Pharaoh and causing Pharaoh's heart to be hardened until his firstborn son, a type of the Lord Jesus, had died at God's judgment by the death angel because it's only the son who sets free. So of Pharaoh's son, God said, Exodus 11, verse 1, and then we we'll go to verse 4 and 5. We are almost getting done. You see why I said I could not go past verse 20? <laughs> of Romans 9. Let's go Exodus 11, Exodus 11, verse 1, and then we'll skip to verse 4 and 5. And the Lord said to Moses, I'll bring yet one more plague on Pharaoh and on Egypt. Afterward, he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out of here altogether. One more plague. One more plague and freedom comes. Verse 4. Then Moses said, Thus says the Lord, about midnight I'll go out into the midst of Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne. Right there. Don't miss that. From the firstborn of Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the female servant who is behind the hand mill, and all the firstborn of the animals. When the firstborn of Pharaoh dies, Pharaoh will get up in the middle of the night to look for Moses to set the people free. If the firstborn of Egypt had died, except the death of the firstborn of Pharaoh, Pharaoh would still not let the people go. That's clear. If all the firstborn of Egypt had died, save for the firstborn of Pharaoh. Pharaoh would not let the people go. So that tells you that the condition of our justification was the death of the firstborn of God, the Lord Jesus. That is the only condition. And yet people are attacking that and saying, oh no, we are not justified until we believe. No, oh, we are defending justifi justification by faith. No, you're not defending justification by faith. You are denying it. The condition of justification is not your faith. It is the death of the firstborn of God. So God is preaching his sovereignty in the matter of salvation. And this he said and did so that his name may be proclaimed in all the earth in Christ Jesus, even as it is today. But there's more to consider. He said, for this very purpose, I raised you. And that is saying everyone has been raised by God for a purpose. They were not raised because mom and dad wanted more piglets to feed. God says, no, it was his purpose that he may be glorified on the earth. And he will be glorified in every little detail of our lives. He is behind it all and everything that God appointed for you to do, you shall do. Every jot and tittle because you are not just loitering on the earth. You are under the decree of the sovereign. The decree of for this very purpose, I raised you. You are not just loitering around eating bagels and chipotle. <laughs> So what is the conclusion of the whole matter? 
if we have understood Paul's arguments, verse 18. Therefore, he has mercy on whom he wills. And whom he wills, he hardens. God has mercy on whom he wills. He will save whomever he wills. And he saved all whom he wills. That's true sovereign grace gospel. But many will come and say they believe this. And then turn around and say, so and so is not saved because they do not agree with us. They'll come and say there's no hope for the aborted or those with mental disabilities. And that, my friends, is speaking beyond one's job qualification or pay grade. Since when did you and I stop or graduate from being mentally handicapped? Are we not all mentally handicapped? How did we graduate from being, and when, from being infants? Are we not all infants as far as God is concerned? I pray God makes us to see that we too are infants and are more mentally handicapped than we are infants. Yes, we are. The Lord Jesus said in Matthew 8, verse 3, Assuredly, I say to you, unless you are converted and become as little children, you will by no means enter the kingdom of heaven. It's good to be an infant. It's good to be mentally handicapped. Don't trust in yourself. God said and says he has mercy on whom he wills. So if he willed to save an infant, then that infant is saved because it pleased him to save them. And Christ Jesus is enough for them. People have elevated faith beyond what it needs to be. Faith does not save people, my friends. Faith does not save people. Those verses that you caught still need to be understood correctly in the context of the whole foundation of the gospel. Faith does not cause salvation. God does not impute righteousness because of our faith. That's false teaching. False interpretation. All the elect were justified when their sins were paid for, when their representative mediator died on the cross and he said it's finished. So faith is given as evidence of possession of that righteousness, not the cause of that righteousness. Faith evidences that when Christ died, you were in union with him and that God reckoned you as righteous because of that payment. He was given over because of our transgressions and raised because of our justification. We were justified when he died because that's when the payment was made. There's no one who belongs to Christ who still owes God anything. After the cross, there's no way, there's no way. I'll never agree with that. I'll, I'll never agree with that. You can argue with me, man. You can say whatever bad things you say. But logically, I'll never agree. Because you cannot remain under a debt that was paid for. It doesn't make sense to me. But that would be the reason of your condemnation. If you were condemned last week and got justified today, who paid for your sins till last week? But Jesus did not die anymore. So it's either he already did it or he didn't. 
But the side B to this. If he has mercy on whom he wills, it also means he hardens whomever he, will, he wills. And God does not say he leaves people to themselves as taught by a lot of Calvinists. No, God claims that he actually hardens people. And this would be accurate because of the objection that follows in verse 19, which says, you say to me then, why does he still find fault? For who has resisted his will? So if God is the one who is making this determination, based on nothing that a person has done wrong, why then does he still find fault? If he has the ability to just save all, God has ability to save everyone. There's nothing that would get in the way of God if he wanted to save all. But there's a problem. He does not save all people. This is what he was pleased to do. So if that's true, why then does he still find fault? Why does he still send a person to hell whom he had power to serve? And many reformed and some of the sovereign grace people again will try to give their arguments a soft landing and try to shave off some of the offense and say, oh, they go to hell because they failed to choose Jesus, because of their sin, because they did not want to repent. And they'll say, God sends you to heaven by grace, but hell is what you decide for yourself. That is false. No one decides heaven or hell. You do not decide either one of them. What separates hell and heaven for a person is God. It is his decree. And Christ's blood, Christ's blood alone brought you to heaven and God's decree. And hell is God's decree. But there will be more sinners, there will even be worse sinners in heaven than who go to hell. Yes, there will be some serious, notorious sinners. Remember the thief on the cross? He was still a thief, right? Even as he was put on the cross. It means he had been stealing all his life. The thief on the cross business was stealing. From people, breaking people's homes, into people's homes. And Jesus comes and says, oh, it belongs to me. You go tell that to the government and see what they can do to me. So Paul is denying, God is denying that reasoning, that the sinner goes anywhere because of their choice. Paul is putting the reason on God alone, not on man. Because if man's determination and their sin was the determining factor, the objection would not have been raised. There would not be an offense. The objection is raised because it is God who is sending to condemnation one who did not cause it, one whom he had power to serve and making that determination before the person had done nothing wrong. And that is the issue. And if you dilute this argument and try to ascribe a person's condemnation to their sin, you have missed the arguments. Totally you have. You have not understood it. But how does God answer the objection? That's going to be our last verse. Verse 20. But indeed, oh man, who are you? To reply against God. Will the thing formed say to him, who formed it, why have you made me like this? Paul then invoked the freedom of the porter and said, well, let us start by looking at the pecking order here. Indeed, all oh men, what are you on, the, on a piece of chicken? What are you on a piece of chicken? 
Are you drumstick or are you the chicken breast? Uh, chicken feet. Who are you to reply against God? Exactly the matter that God raised with Job from the whirlwind. What are your qualifications? Where did you go to school? Do you really know who you are and who I am that you should stand up and try to argue with me, your maker? You, the formed, the created, have no right to speak. Why? Because I made you. That which is formed does not give itself its nature of being. Our genetics are secondary to what God is saying. God is saying, whatever your genetics do in you and to you, he caused it. Just like pottery or anything mad cannot argue with its maker. A basket, a bicycle, a sandwich, clothing items, pottery, you name it. None ever raises their hand to argue with you when you make some bad food. No chicken sandwich ever says, you should have made me a hamburger instead. Double cheeseburger with extra mayo and mustard and no ketchup. Oh, I didn't like that lettuce, that was too much. Can you dial down on that lettuce? I do not like it. And God is saying, <laughs> it is exactly as he has decided. Your nature works exactly as God intends to use you and me to his glory. Our sin was not our invention. Ultimately, it was not. It was the work of the porter as he was fitting his vessels for his sovereign purpose. And we have no right to argue with God about the issue. Yeah? So God, as the porter, has the power to do whatever he wants with the clay to fashion vessels of honor and vessels of dishonor. But we have said a lot of things because of the nature of the topic and because of what God gave in the text. And we cannot finish it today. We are going to have to come back and pick up on these matters that we discuss again in the next message. But I pray that you have so far understood that God is sovereign and that he is absolutely sovereign. And we can't push his sovereignty too much. Our problem is that we try to limit his sovereignty and we begin to ascribe power to things that have no power in themselves, that is ourselves. You, me, the devil, sin, you name it. No unrighteousness with God. And he, as the porter, has the sovereign right and power to fashion vessels as he sees fit to the glory of his name. And God be praised, and to that we say amen. Amen. All right, good people. <laughs> it's a lot of work to do what I do. The Lord expanded a lot of my points as I was talking. <laughs> so I'm pretty sure I pray that I said what needed to be said. But if you are struggling with this kind of teaching, come back to it. And pray that the Lord will give you the ears to hear. But this is a hard saying, but that's the truth of God. It cannot be denied. Okay? All right, God be praised. Let us pray.
Oh, Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for these many words that we have had about your sovereignty in all things as the porter who has the right to do with your creation as you see fit, even as you chose us in Christ. It was pleased to redeem us and justify us in his death. We thank you for giving us the spirit, your spirit, to give us conviction and acceptance of these hard truths. And may you help your people who struggle with these things to settle and to sort things out. And that to the glory of your name, we honor you for all things. Be with us now going in and out, be with the people who are struggling with all kinds of infirmities, who are dealing with family things, who are bereaved, who are just struggling with life. Lord, have mercy upon them and revive their spirits and remind them of the life that is hidden in Christ. Lord, we honor you, glorify you for all things we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, my people. We'll see you later.